Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Philip Shane, Paul Boyer, Brad, and our new patron, Farhan. Welcome, Farhan. Good to have you. Yay. Yay. On this episode of DTNS, what is going on at Xbox and the gaming studios under its umbrella? The plot ever thickens. Plus, TikTok joins the trend of making AI transparent, and Shannon Morse is going to explain AI-generated voice and how it might affect your security. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, May 9th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Well, I'm glad we're all here today because we've got a lot of tech news to get through. And as we do on every show, we'll start with the quick hits. Now, Neuralink is not the only or even the first brain-computer interface company, but due to a variety of factors, some of it being the executives behind the company, it does tend to dominate press in this category. Neuralink reported it had implanted its tech in the first human patient as a trial back in January. The company posted Wednesday that some of the threads that connected the device to the neurons retracted in the patient's brain, which reduced the ability to measure speed and accuracy. The company says it compensated by modifying the algorithm that interpreted the signals and improving the techniques for translating those signals to cursory movements. Now, this doesn't pose a health risk to the patient. The patient is reportedly still using it eight hours per day. Disney and Warner Brothers Discovery announced a combined streaming service bundle, including Disney Plus, Hulu, and Max content for one price starting sometime this summer. What that price might be wasn't shared. ESPN Plus also wasn't mentioned as part of the bundle, but Disney CEO Bob Iger previously said main ESPN content would be coming to Disney Plus by the end of this year. Disney is also partnering with Fox and Warner on a combined sports service, and reportedly Paramount wants to bundle Paramount Plus Showtime with Peacock. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, cable alternative bundles in GDI later in the show because, boy, do we have options more than ever. And yet it can be a little confusing, Uh, as is always the case with uh, successful, respected, beloved, controversial or a combination of all four types CEOs. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman wrote Wednesday that when it comes to who might replace current Apple CEO Tim Cook at some point, because he's 64 and some wondered when he might want to retire, things aren't totally clear. Sources tell Gurman that if a change were to be made soon, Chief Operating Officer Jeff Williams is the most obvious next Apple CEO. But Williams is only a few years younger than Cook. The Apple board reportedly would like to have someone at the helm who's going to stick around for a decade, if not longer. If Cook remains CEO for another few years, which is possible, the report points to John Turnus, current senior vice president of hardware engineering as the most likely successor. A new study from Pew Research Center surveyed 1,423 U.S. teens between the ages of 13 and 17 about their video game habits. If they play, how often they play, how friendships are forged, and if games get in the way of them doing well in school or sleeping well. 85% of U.S. teens say they play video games, with 41% playing daily. 72% of players say gaming is a way to spend time with their friends, with over half saying gaming helps their problem-solving skills. And 41% also saying that it has hurt their sleep. Bullying is an ongoing problem with 80% of all teens saying harassment over video games is a problem. Mm, That last part is interesting because even the, the teens who say they're not gamers say there's an issue with harassment in gaming. Four to to five. On Wednesday, OpenAI published its model spec, which lists the rules that OpenAI says should govern its models like chat GPT. These rules help create filters and tuning to reduce false or dangerous responses. Developer intent, also a big part of the model spec, for example, using a model to answer questions about language learning, shouldn't be including other topics or straying away too much from the intended result. OpenAI also wants to distinguish things like health information from NSFW content, not safe for work content, with the document explaining, quote, we're exploring whether we can responsibly provide the ability to generate NSFW content in age-appropriate contexts. 
All right, Rob. Uh, things have been, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's been a roller coaster over um, at uh, Xbox Studios. So let's talk about that. Yeah, it, it's it's definitely been a week at Microsoft. Things are feeling a bit chaotic for Xbox. Tuesday, three Xbox subsidiaries were shuttered with the absorption of a fourth. Two um, two of the studios affected include Arcane Austin and Tokyo-based Tango Gameworks, maker of action game Hi-Fi Rush. Bloomberg sources say Tango was in the process of pitching a sequel due to the critical acclaim of the game, which would require continued investment from Xbox. Also reported this week, Xbox started offering voluntary severance agreements to producers, quality assurance testers, and other staff at ZeniMax, which Xbox purchased in 2020 for $7.5 billion. Sources also say Xbox is planning Planning more cuts during a town hall with Zenimax staff, which happened yesterday morning, Wednesday morning. Xbox president Matt Booty said that the company's studios had been spread too thin, using the analogy of peanut butter on bread. I don't know, maybe you like thin peanut butter on your bread, but you know, you get the reference. And that leaders across the division were understaffed, and closing studios opened up resources elsewhere. That's pretty common for you know when a company wants to downsize saying you know we're just going to consolidate resources etc cetera, etc cetera. jill braff who's head of zenimax studios said in that same town hall that she hoped the reorg would allow the division which also develops fallout and doom to work more closely on fewer projects and that quote it's hard to support nine studios all across the world with a lean central team with an ever-growing plate of things to do end quote okay so Plenty of folks in the industry shaking their heads, saying Microsoft bought up a bunch of gaming companies. You know, maybe this is pan pandemic related when a lot of people were home, you know, enjoyed enjoyed the, you know, the fruits of that. And now saying, well, hold on a second. Centrally, we can't support all these folks. Shannon, what do you think about this? You know, it's it is concerning. Of course, I I feel for the folks that are being let go like that's kind of the worst thing that can happen to you and it's usually out of the blue you have no idea but when it comes to the the gaming industry i'm often concerned as a gamer with how this is going to affect games that i'm looking forward to given that they're they're you know lowering the amount of staff that is going to be working on these and they're focusing like like jill mentioned on like just specific few games, for example, like, is that going to delay games that I've been looking forward to for a few years? Like, for example, Fallout 5, like, is that going to be delayed even further? Because we're not expecting that for a few years after Elder Scrolls, like the newest Elder Scrolls game. So you never really know if these are going to affect how the current market is selling these games. Are they going to have as many coming out every year? Are we going to see these delays? So and anytime I see something like this, I always call back to it. If we do see delay announcements, I'm like, well, it's probably because of because of that. That's probably one of the reasons. Yeah. So, yeah. Go ahead, Rob. So so one of the things that happens to companies in general, Microsoft and Xbox are not immune to this. In times of boom, they overhire, they overcommit to things they're going to do. And it always comes back to the mean. So we basically had this little, you know, this little incident where Earth shut down for about two and a half years and everyone was home. So what did people do? They played a lot of video games. So all the video game developers said, oh, let's create more video games. And they did so to the extent that now that we're out of that boom time. We're in the, you know, we're in the, you know, we're, we're in the, it's dwindling time. So what is happening now is that, oh, wow, people aren't playing as many games. We're not making as much money. Well, let's cut this. Let's get rid of this studio. Let's combine these studios together. Let's, let's push this out a little bit. And it seems like this is just the ebb and flow, uh, ebb and flow of how gaming has been literally for decades, but it's exacerbated because it was it was really put on, you know, they were really put on steroids with, with what they did during the pandemic. And now I think things are just kind of right sizing back to where they probably should have been in the first place. 100 percent. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I've never worked at a gaming studio um, or, uh, you know, it, it, in any capacity. But this sounds a lot like, OK, you know, let's you know, let's capitalize on the fact that uh, we're experiencing a bunch of growth, even if that's not sustainable. Capitalize now, cut back later. And that is why I think 
you end up having a lot of people who say like, I do great work. I'm so smart. I'm creative. Like, how did I lose my job? You know, this, you know, this injustice cannot stand. And that is, that's a big, uh, you know, it's, there, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference between being part of an executive team and looking at numbers and saying, yeah, we need to make cuts. Um, when we, you know, when you're running something like Xbox, you got a lot of people who you might per per not personally know and not that they're not great. You simply don't have the money even for this wonderful game. Shannon, you mentioned Fallout 5. Um, supposedly, you know, the, the uh, successor to Hi-Fi Rush wididly yeah. uh, anticipated if there is a money then you know maybe it'll be revisited down the road maybe not i mean this this speaks to a broader issue and in in many ways the video game industry is is a parallel to the entertainment industry in a, in a much broader sense um video games require a huge budget especially triple a games you're looking at a quarter of a billion in some cases up to and even passing a billion dollars in terms of not just development costs but marketing and all the other stuff you do to make something successful hi-fi rush was well received but it didn't really sell as much as they wanted uh uh arcane austin was the 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 creators of redfall which uh, was highly anticipated, but literally shipped with a number of uh, bugs that made it nearly unplayable for for a good many people. Uh, and you know they worked through it, but the problem is that it affected the sales of these games, which now are are retailing at seventy bucks. So you have kind of a vicious cycle. You have game development budgets that are increasingly getting larger because people want to ensure that the game that they're releasing. Uh, finds an audience, not unlike making a summer blockbuster, right? You tend to focus on the movies, which is why summer blockbusters all kind of feel the same uh, at a certain point is because there's a very formulaic approach to it. We know we can get X amount of dollars uh, our ROI, a return on investment when we make this kind of movie. We, when we make this kind of tentpole game, we know we can expect this X amount of dollars. And unfortunately, what happens is that kind of sh shortens the uh, or, or reduces the, the the available funding for all the other studios and also it limits the uh, the ability to kind of break out of the mold with something unique or or interesting that isn't the same you know run and gun shooter or sports uh, sports game or you know some other uh, version of a platformer and so what you're seeing is kind of the the industry maturing but also coming to the grips with you know what Rob was saying, it's going through a, a, a boom and bust cycle uh, that I don't think is going to be changing anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. Well, folks, TikTok announced Thursday that it's, and that's today, that it will start adding an AI generated label to third party AI generated content watermarked with content credentials, the technology from the Coalition of Content Pro. Provenance and authenticity, authenticity, C2PA, founded by Microsoft and Adobe and other companies. TikTok already labels content made with TikTok AI effects with an AI flag, but will start automatically labeling content uploaded to the platform with content credential tags from platforms such as Dolly 3 and Being Image Creator. Google has pledged to support content credentials as well. And in a later phase, TikTok will start adding content credential tags to metadata to, of content created with TikTok's own AI effects. Uh, products to content downloaded for posting elsewhere. This all works by adding a symbol alongside metadata of content generated with the AI, uh, establishing the, its provenance or its origin of the content. So I think what's what's happening here is that uh, definitely TikTok. I think you're going to see this with Instagram and, and and Facebook and just Meta products in general and other social media platforms is that they want to make their users very aware of when something is fake versus when something is 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 real uh they, they don't want to have users thinking oh i can't get real content here so i'm going to go elsewhere for it so i think that they're going to do whatever they can do and this c2pa foundation essentially is saying well hey we're, here's what we're going to do this is a standard we're going to put these flags in or these but basically they're going to put a little image in the ai metadata uh letting you know where a image originated from that way you won't be fooled by something because AI just keeps getting better and better every day. So right now it's just TikTok, but my gut tells me you're going to see other social media platforms follow along with this uh, standard from C2PA as well. You know, this reminds me, and I know it's it's little apples and oranges, but, you know, TikTok doing this is not just like, we just want 
our community to know what's real and what isn't. It's TikTok being like, hey, we're going to label it and then it's up to you. We're doing our best. We do not want to be liable for you know a, a, a situation coming down the road. But it also reminds me of back a, a few years ago when social media companies were accused of not um, – that forcing creators to make it more aware when something was an ad, you know, it's a video. Oh, you know, this is my favorite new mug, you know, <laughs> you know, like you got to do hashtag ad or partner affiliate, or, you know, there, there are all sorts of uh, standards in place that didn't used to be there. And it was confusing. Um, and uh, many social companies were forced to say, yeah, okay, it's confusing. We're going to have to make the creator do that. And if they don't, it's not on us. That's, you know, that's on them and either something gets taken down or worse. But I think in general, you know, if I draw a, you know, stick figure of Shannon and update it, uh, upload it to TikTok and say, look at Shannon Morse, everybody. No one thinks that that's really her. <laughs> you know, they're like, OK, Sarah's like a really bad artist. But if I create something that's pretty close, you know, or at least is going to fool a certain amount of people. Yeah, that might be a fun thing that Shannon and I decided to do. It doesn't mean it's a bad idea, but it should be very clear that it's an art generated or, you know, AI generated uh, product. And that that helps me and Shannon and the company that is providing the platform, you know, that we're having fun in. You know, <laughs> thanks for using me as an example, Sarah. <laughs> uh, one thing that I noticed just a on a binder of stick figures of Shannon, I guess I'll just admit <laughs> that now. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, I recently noticed that on YouTube, when you are a content creator and you're uploading a new video, they now have a setting that you have to choose between yes or no. That includes uh, is this like AI generated content? I don't remember exactly what it is. I never use AI generated content, so I always check no when I'm uploading my videos for my channel. So I would love to see like Instagram do the same thing that TikTok is doing here because I often run across like in the anime space, you have cosplayers who go to conventions and they dress up as their favorite cartoon character. And oftentimes I'm seeing AI generated cosplay. And I see all these comments from people that are saying like, oh my gosh, who did this cosplay? Like, who's this model? Who's the photographer? And there is none because it's it's AI generated. So like these people are being faked out by this AI generated content. So I want to see more flagging happen, especially as a content creator myself, because I want to make it clear if I'm the person that's actually standing in front of a camera or if somebody like you gave that example, Sarah, uh, if somebody had created a, a AI generated Shannon Morse to do some kind of video, like I want people to know whether it's me or whether it's not me. And right now we don't have enough flags or those flags aren't really available to us. So good job, TikTok. We need more. Well, <laughs> Let's see I this across the, all platforms. The cosplay example is a really good one. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, if, if AI generated art is, uh, you know, adding to the fun, you know, inspiring joy. It's like, that's not a bad thing. It's just a different category. Yeah. And, and you know, if we can celebrate that category for what it is, and there are going to be superstars, like, you know, somebody who's just like the AI, uh, biggest AI artist. I mean, you already see that kind of stuff now. That's cool. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that we have to understand that this is an emergence of something, you know, beyond what we know to exist. And let's not confuse ourselves. Right. I agree. Well, good. Um, <laughs> uh, you might uh, be using an Android device and maybe very interested in AI. Uh, you might be an Android enthusiast or you just like to follow Android news. If so... Android Faithful may be the podcast for you. Every week, Android aficionados Ron Richards, Huan Tui Rao, Michelle Ramon, and Jason Howell bring you the latest in Android, latest and greatest, all the good things. You can watch it live. Uh, they record Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern, that's 5 p.m. Pacific, at youtube.com slash daily tech news show. And you su can subscribe to the Android Faithful feed at androidfaithful.com. <laughs> 
Back in February, Motherboard posted a story by Joseph Cox titled How I Broke Into a Bank Account with an AI-Generated Voice. In the report, Cox details how he was able to fool his bank's voice ID security system by using a generative AI version of his voice. Although Cox's four initial attempts failed, he eventually found success using Eleven Labs' voice creation service. The bank offered only one follow-up security challenge, his birth date, that Cox also bypassed using an AI-Generated version of his voice. Now, Cox points out that although Lloyd's of London was the bank used in this demonstration, many banks in the U.S. also offer the Voice ID security feature. That would be including TD Bank, Chase, Wells Fargo, big banks. Cox also said that after sending the video to the U.S. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the agency replied, quote, the CFBP, uh, PB rather, is concerned with data security and companies are on notice that they'll be held accountable for shoddy practices. We expect that any firm follow the law regardless of technology used, end quote. Don't know exactly <laughs> what they're going to do about it, but they're saying we don't agree with this. So Shannon, as somebody who follows data security issues really closely, how big is this issue? Because it's kind of new to me. I didn't realize this was something that, you know, you could bypass security by doing. Yeah, honestly, I didn't either. Like, I must have totally missed the news when it first came out. But apparently, a lot of banks have been introducing voice ID or voice authentication over phone as as a way to authenticate you instead of using a password or a PIN, for example. And when I look back at this, we have not had any uh, clear public indications that somebody has actually used this in a malicious form to hack into somebody's account and like steal their monies. So, so far, We haven't seen like a a malicious attacker actually do this, but because of Joseph Cox and because of people like Rachel Toback, who is a professional penetration tester and social engineer, we know that this is possible because we've seen um, really uh, ethical hackers already doing this to show people that it's it's a thing that can absolutely happen. And that's what concerns me is even though we haven't had it maliciously happen to anybody yet, we know that it could. And given that you can also do things like you can clone a phone number and you can make it look like the person you're like for the person that you're calling the contact, the receiver, it can look to them as you're, you're calling from an authenticated number and you put that on top of voice ID matching, who's going to know any better that it's not you. And with AI and how much better it's been getting over the past, just the past year in the past six months, we know that people can create kind of duplicates of your voice And given that Joseph has shown in his article here that he can easily just type something in and it will speak loud and clearly and make it sound exactly like his voice, like who's to say that this couldn't happen? So I am concerned, especially now that we're seeing so many banks doing this. And and from the descriptions and FAQs uh, that we're seeing from all these banks' different websites, it sounds like they're all using very, very similar technology because they're all describing it as, oh, this uses 100 different pinpoints to authenticate your voice, like your pitch and your dialogue. Uh, for example, the catalyst for me this week was a user told me that USAA just introduced this. And I looked it up and they do have this FAQ site that we're showing on screen right now. And it's definitely a thing. So given that they're using it as a biometric identifier, like, I'm concerned. Are you concerned? <laughs> yes, I, I, I am concerned. So concerned that I would just flat out say, if you have not already set up voice authentication for your bank, just don't just yeah, just don't keep do doing what you're doing. Or if they give you, uh, you know, a, a another type of two factor authentication, do that. That's that those are very secure. But at this point, I simply just would not do this because you, you just never know. The, the These AI gets better every single day. Yeah, so really we're going to get to a point very, very quickly to where you can literally go to a website and just type and it's going to sound exactly like you. And I just, like I said, I'm just giving a public service announcement. I simply would not sign up for this if you have not already. And I, I, think I was trying to think to about, too. you know, oh, go ahead, Shannon. 
um, I think it's important to note too, is that if, if your voice isn't already out there, maybe you don't have as much concern with this because people don't have access to your voice. But if you're a podcaster, if you're a YouTuber, if you're on TV doing journalism, if you're the weatherman, like there are going to be proponents of that where people have recorded your voice and they would have access to that. Even if you're well, like and in even a if classroom. you're just a guest on a podcast once. Oh, yeah, you know, it doesn't take that. You know, it's like you don't have to have hours of you know uh, of audio recordings. I was, I was, I was trying, I was trying to think of okay, when does something like this, you know, you know, take away the fact that it, voices could be AI generated for a second? When would this be something that, like, in a last ditch effort, would be the security you need? You know, am I? Um, far away from home. Maybe I'm on vacation. Maybe I've lost my wallet. Maybe I'm lost. Maybe something catastrophic has happened. And all I have access to is like a payphone to call my bank. Would this be some way for me to, you know, get back some control? I guess. But how often does that happen? Mm -hmm. I feel like we're so, it's so much more likely that this is going to be abused. Yeah. And the thing with phone calls is you do have multi-factor authentication options. You have knowledge-based identifiers that you could use. And if a bank is using multiple knowledge-based identifiers, like a password and a PIN and something that only you would know, uh, they could even like they could send you, uh, well, maybe not for, for a payphone in, in your example, but they could send you like a, t a one time code to your email or to your phone mm -hmm. that you could use instead. So there are other options. And as long as they're using multiple of those options, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to use those as opposed to just your voice. Yeah. And I'm thinking you don't have to be public, but people are. Everybody is creating TikToks. Everybody, you know, not everybody, many people play video games that are uh, community based games. Someone could get your voice off of a video game. Yeah, There's so yeah. many ways that you're just not thinking of that your voice could be captured. And it doesn't take a lot. You don't have to read Webster's or, or you know, or Marion's dictionary to 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 to, uh, you know, to get every single word. You just need to read a bunch of them and get close enough. Uh, these systems are really, really effective at recreating what you sound like. I've played with a few of them and it's like, oh, wow, that does really sound like me. So as I said earlier, just as a public service announcement, if you have not already set this up, I would think twice about setting it up. Just just do something else. Use a nice two-factor authentication with an actual authentication tool as compared to uh, text messaging. And those are going to be good enough, in my opinion. I'm in agreement. And luckily, the voice ID authentication for all the banks that I have looked at so far is an opt-in option. So you do not have to set this up if you don't want to. Um, well, Shannon, good stuff as always. Thanks for uh, explaining something that I think a lot of people had not heard of before, or maybe didn't didn't realize the you know implications of using. So, thank you once again. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, Tinas, who lives in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, wrote in uh, because Tinas is on the ground. We've been talking about Amazon expanding into the country. Tinas says, OK, so Amazon launched to barely a whimper. To call it underwhelming is being kind. It's extremely sparse, very limited products. Most categories barely have two pages of products that are available to order, with the majority of products listed uh, marked as unavailable. They've partnered with local couriers for a delivery. They're not offering Prime, not offering cross-shipment from their UK or US stores, no Kindle sales or books. Now, Amazon has shipped selected categories of products from the US and UK marketplaces for years. The delivery fee was high, though. They handled the import and duty parts of it very well, however, including billing and local currency. Kindles have been available from the international store with five business days deliveries since probably the, the time they launched it outside the US. Prime Video operates, has operated for some time here. They're not unknown. But uh, Tinas, uh, Tina says, Take a Lot is the biggest player here. And that was something that Tom was talking about as we talked about this last week. Take a Lot has uh, much more molded themselves on the Amazon model. They have most things under the sun. Their own fast delivery, distribution network, large third-party marketplace. Also very active in our market are the largest three grocery stores 
Those are chains offering store delivery with online ordering. Uh, Tina says, Amazon has been recruiting aggressively locally, though, and has rented warehouse space in the three largest metros, Cape Town, Durban, Johannesburg. So it looks like they're here for the long term, but they have a lot of work to do to be compelling. AWS, on the other hand, massive player locally and have been for a while. Uh, Tina, thanks so much uh, for that. Uh, yesterday on the show, uh, we uh, uh, featured a mailbag from someone who is South African but now lives in Australia and said Australia was a little slow on the uptake as well. Um, it's gotten better. So, yeah, it sounds like Amazon is 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 wading into the so South African market um, uh, one step at a time. Shannon Morse, thank you so much for being with us today. What is your latest? Where can people find it? Oh, gosh, I've been super busy over on my YouTube channel developing a bunch of videos. Uh, the most recent one was all about your questions that I was answering all about the YubiKey. Uh, very interesting answering a lot of things that m people may not fully understand on YubiKey. So I'm just trying to help out there. And they also recently introduced some new keys. So I feel like it's pretty relevant given that they have new ones coming out right now. Well, we're so glad to have you on the show and uh, we'll be talking about more stuff in GDI. Speaking of GDI, if you're a patron, do stick around for our extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to talk a little bit more about that new Disney Plus, Hulu, and Max content bundle. What might it cost? And would you pay for it? You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com forward slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with a RSA security conference wrap up. And David Spark is our guest. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>